Good evening, everyone. It's Lindsay here again. Uh, I haven't done an ASMR video in a while. Well, really, I haven't done any videos in a while. I've had a lot going on in my personal life. Um, I've actually, unfor really, unfortunately, been having some issues with um, with uh, depression and anxiety, and having a lot of issues with sleep lately. And just got a lot going on with my studies and my career. So. Uh, thankfully, I think I'm you now I'm kind of moving past that. I've thankfully um, moved through a lot of the main stressors that were happening in my life, but I wanted to get back into one of the videos I really enjoy, which is just reading a book that I really like. So if you've seen some of my other videos where I read to you as my audience, the book I was reading before was this book, Pushback, by Dr. Amy Tutorin. Um, I, I did finish this on my own, but I really did enjoy this book a lot. This really was a favorite of mine, so I really hope other people enjoyed this as well. I'll probably do a full in-depth review of it at some point, so be on the lookout for that if that's something that you would be interested in seeing. So the book I've started reading now that I've finished... Sorry for the noise of my heater in the background. It's just, it's a little cold today in London, so I had to make sure to stay nice and warm in my room. But the book I've been reading now since finishing Pushback is this book called This Is Going to Hurt by Adam Kay. So this uh, gentleman, just to give you a little context, because we'll be jumping in here a little bit, but this, um, this young man was a junior doctor here in England. He worked for the NHS, which was which is a um, prominent healthcare provider here in England. And this book is really his kind of uh, journals, his diaries of um, just his experiences with uh, being a junior doctor, um, especially coming fresh out of medical school and um, being led up to believe that being a doctor would be a certain thing, and in many ways finding out it's something different, and I really enjoyed this book a lot, um, I'm just partially just because it's very well written, very entertaining, very funny and engaging, but also because uh, I'm, uh, as I've mentioned before, I'm someone who does want to be a doctor one day in the, in the United States, not in England, so it's slightly different, but still I think it's very interesting to read uh, from the perspective of someone who uh, was a doctor and then chose, chose to stop, chose to leave that career. I think that's a very important perspective to gain as someone who wants to be a doctor. So anyway, let's get into this. Chapter 2. Senior House Officer, Post 1. By August 2005, I was a senior house officer. I was obviously still extremely junior, having only been a doctor for 12 months, but the word senior had now been chucked into my job title. This was presumably to give patients a bit of confidence in the 25-year-old about to take a scalpel to their abdomen. It was also the little morale boost I needed to stop myself jumping off the hospital roof when I first saw my new Rhoda. It would be pushing it to call it a promotion, though. It happens automatically after a year as a house officer, much like when you get a star on your McDonald's badge. Though I, res I suspect Ronald pays much better than NHS trusts do. My hourly rate as a first-year SHO worked out as six pounds, 60 pence. It's slightly more than McDonald's till staff get, though significantly less than a shift supervisor. I believe it's technically possible to fail the house officer year and be required to repeat it, but I've never actually heard of that happening. By way of context, I could count among my friends a house officer who slept with a patient in an on-call room and another who got distracted and prescribed penicillin instead of paracetamol to a patient with a penicillin allergy. They both sailed through it, so Christ knows what you have to do to actually fail. 
senior house officer is the point at which you decide what to specialize in. If you choose general practice, you remain in hospital for a couple of years, doing things like A and E, general medicine and pediatrics, before moving to the community and being awarded your elbow patches and permanently raised eyebrow. If you choose hospital medicine, there are plenty of different roads you can stumble blindly down. If you fancy yourself as a surgeon, you can sign up to anything from colorectal surgery to cardiothoracics, neurosurgery to orthopedics. Orthopedics is basically reserved for the med school's rugby team. It's barely more than sawing and nailing, and I suspect they don't sign up for it so much as dip their hand in ink and provide a palm print. There are various branches of general medicine. If you don't like getting dirt under your nails, such as geriatrics, cardiology, respiratory, or dermatology, which can be a revolting but relatively easy life, you can count the number of times you'd be woken up for a dermatological emergency on the fingers of one scaly, flaky hand. Plus, there's a bunch of specialties that aren't quite medicine or surgery, like anesthetics, radiology, or obstetrics and gynecology. I chose obs and gyne, or brats and twats, as it was charmingly known at my medical school. I'd done my BSc thesis in the field, so I had a little bit of a head start so long as people only asked me questions about early neonatal outcome in the children of mothers with antiphospholipid syndrome, which somehow they never did. I liked that in obstetrics, you end up with twice the number of patients you started with, which is an unusually good batting average compared to other specialties. I'm looking at you, geriatrics. I also remember being told by one of the registrars during my student placement that he'd chosen obs and gyne because it was easy. Labor ward is literally four things. Caesareans, forceps, ventus, and sewing up the mess you've made. I also liked that it was a blend of medicine and surgery. My house officer jobs had provided, had proved I shouldn't really be majoring in either. It would give me a chance to work in infertility clinics and labor wards. What could be better, more rewarding use of my training than delivering babies and helping couples who otherwise, who couldn't otherwise have them? Of course, the job would be difficult emotionally when things went wrong. Not every stork has a happy landing, but unfortunately, the depth of the lows is the price you pay for the height of the highs. There was also the fact that I'd ruled out every other specialty in quick succession. Too depressing. Too difficult. Too boring. Too revolting. Bob's and Gyne was the only one that excited me a career I could genuinely look forward to. In the event, it took me months to actually make up my mind, commit, and apply. I think the reason I hesitated was that I hadn't. It's a bit late here. I think the reason I hesitated was that I hadn't made any significant life decisions since I chose which medical school to go to at the age of 18, and even that was mostly because I was impressed with the curly fries in the students' union. Age 25 was the first point I actually got to make an active decision in the Choose Your Own Adventure book of my life. I not only had to learn how to make a decision, but also ensure I made the right one. You decide to pick up the forceps. Turn to page 34. Let's do that. Monday. 
8 August 2005. First week working on labor ward. Called in by the midwife because patient DH was feeling unwell shortly after delivering a healthy baby. Nobody likes a clever dick, but it didn't take Columbo, Jessica Fletcher, and the entire occupancy of 221B Baker Street to work out the patient was probably feeling unwell because of the liters of blood cascading unnoticed out of her vagina. I pressed the emergency buzzer, hoped someone a bit more useful would appear, and unconvincingly reassured the patient that everything was going to be fine while she continued to redecorate my legs with her blood volume. The senior registrar ran in, performed a PV, and removed a piece of placenta that was causing the issue. PV is a per-vagina examination. PR is a per-rectum examination, so do always clarify when someone tells you they work in PR. If there's anything left in the uterus after delivery, placenta, amniotic membranes, a Lego Darth Vader, the uterus can't contract back down properly, and this causes bleeding until the offending item is removed. Once it was coaxed out, and the patient had a few units of blood replaced, she was absolutely fine. I went into the changing rooms to get myself some fresh scrub trousers. It's the third time in a week my boxers have been soaked in someone else's blood, and I've had no option but to chuck them away and continue the shift commando. At 15 pounds a pop for CKs, I think I'm running my job at a loss. This time it had soaked through further than usual, and I found myself washing blood off of my cock. I'm not sure which is worse, the realization I could have caught HIV, or the knowledge that none of my, none of my friends would ever believe this is how I got it. Saturday, 27 August, 2005. Accosted by a house officer to come and take a look at a post-surgical patient who hasn't passed urine in the last nine hours. Doctors are obsessed with urine output, though not in the kind of way that would make you rethink going on a second date with them. It's how you tell if the patient has a low blood volume. This is particularly bad after surgery, as it could mean they're bleeding somewhere or that their kidneys are rogered, neither of which are great. I tell the house officer that I haven't passed urine in the last 11 hours because of people like him wasting my time. His face crumples like a crisp packet in a fat kid's fist, and I instantly feel terrible for being mean to him. That was me a few months ago. I slink off to review the patient. The patient, indeed, has no urine output, but that's because the tubing from her catheter is trapped under the wheel of her bed and her bladder is the size of a space hopper. I stop feeling terrible. Monday, 19 September, 2005. First Ventus delivery. I suddenly feel like an obstetrician. It's a pretty notional job title until you can you know, actually extract a baby. My registrar, Lily, talks me through it gently, but I do it all myself, and it feels fucking great. Congratulations, you did amazingly well there, says Lily. Thank you, I reply, then realize she's actually talking to the mom. Wednesday, 21 September, 2005. Signing a stack of letters to GPs after gyne clinic when Ernie, one of the registrars, an arrogant but funny with it, strides in to borrow an examination lamp. He peers over my shoulder. You're going to get start struck off if you write that. Change it to pus-like or put a hyphen in there somewhere. I look down at the offending phrase. 
she has a pussy discharge. At my next hospital, the gynecology ward was right next to the holding area they put patients in to await transport home. And the sign on the wall said, Gynecology Ward, Discharge Lounge. Wednesday, 16 November, 2005. I glance at the notes before reviewing an elderly gyne patient on the ward round. Good news. Physio have finally been to see her. Bad news. The, patient re the entry reads, Patient too drowsy to assess. I pop in. The patient is dead. Tuesday, 22 November, 2005. I've assisted registrars and consultants in 15 cesareans now. On three or four occasions, they've offered to let me operate while they teach me the steps, but on every occasion I've wimped out. I'm now the only SHO of the new cohort not to have lost my virginity, as Ernie is so keen on putting it. Ernie doesn't give me any option today. He introduces me to the patient as the surgeon who's going to deliver her baby, and so I do. Cherry well and truly popped, and with a live audience. I cut through human skin for the first time, open up a uterus for the first time, and deliver a baby abdominally for the first time. I'd like to say it was an amazing experience, but I was con concentrating far too hard on every step to actually take any of it in. The cesarean takes a laborious 55 minutes. An uncomplicated cesarean should only take 20 to 25 minutes with the wind in the right direction. From start to end, and Ernie is remarkably patient with me. As I clean up the wound afterwards, he points out that my incision was on the wonk by about 10 degrees. He says to the patient, you'll notice when you take the dressing off that we had to go in at a bit of an angle, which she somehow seems to accept without question. The miracle of motherhood sugaring that particular pill. Ernie shows me how to write up the operation notes and debriefs me over coffee, stretching his virginity metaphor to within an inch of its life like he's some kind of sex pervert. Apparently, with practice, my technique will improve. It'll get less bloody and less nerve-wracking. And eventually, it'll all just start feeling like a boring routine. The anesthetist chips in. I wouldn't try and make your performance last any longer, though. All right, we'll go ahead and stop there, just because i got to get to sleep. I have two classes tomorrow, but um, hope you I hope that y'all are enjoying this new book. I really am. I'm liking it a lot, and um, we'll go ahead and read some more of this. Read some more of it together sometime very soon. You guys have a lovely evening.